description. Kate's daughter told the reporter that she found the safeguards to be a roadblock, and eventually a physician was found to write the prescription, and Kate Cheney died from the lethal dose. S74 would make it even harder to determine if a patient was feeling pressured or coerced and make the doctor shopping seen in the Cheney case easier. Under Act 39, not only is the prescribing physician required to do a physical examination of the patient, a second physician is required to conduct an evaluation of the patient as well. While it is not explicit in statute, the practice under Act 39 has been that this second opinion would also be the result of an in-person consultation. But S74 would allow a physician to prescribe the lethal dose of medication without ever meeting the patient or conducting an evaluation of the patient in person. While telemedicine is a useful tool in some cases, we all know from the past two years that online communication is not the same as in-person communication, especially when you are meeting someone for the first time and don't know them at all. While it has been the practice under Act 39 that the second physician also conducts an in-person exam, the law does not explicitly require it. So under S74, the patient would not have to be evaluated in person by either the prescribing or second physician, rendering the safeguard of a second opinion meaningless. The physician may have no relationship with or knowledge of the patient other than reading a medical record. In addition, the medical records could be provided by the patient. They would not necessarily be sent by a physician who performed the exam. The patient would be able to limit the information sent, for instance, by leaving out mental health records. The prescribing and secondary physicians would not know if they had received all relevant medical records. The lack of a required in-person meeting between the physician and patient becomes even more concerning in light of Oregon's 2021 Death with Dignity Annual Report, which lists anorexia as the underlying condition for which lethal drugs were prescribed. This is very significant as it marks the first time a mental illness has been included as an underlying condition that qualifies someone for a lethal prescription. As it is literally a matter of life or death, it should be required that the prescribing physician examine and evaluate the patient in person. When Act 39 was passed, the lethal drugs commonly prescribed were secobarbital and penobarbital. However, those drugs are no longer readily available in the US due to their connection to execution by lethal injection. In recent years, proponents of assisted suicide have been experimenting with a variety of lethal drug cocktails, trying to find a combination that kills most efficiently. Given the ongoing changes being made to the drug protocol, its experimental nature and side effects such as regurgitation and prolonged dying, immunity should not be given to pharmacists and healthcare providers. The pharmacist currently providing the drug combination to patients states that he requires an indemnity agreement be signed to protect himself. I would hope that agreement also makes patients aware that, it, that an expectation that the drug combination will result in a quick, peaceful death may not be what happens. In 2013, supporters of Act 39 insisted that the safeguards included were wanted and necessary. Now they have done a 180, asking for some to be stripped away. What will they be asking from this body next? Instead of removing safeguards, this committee should consider strengthening protections for patients. Is this the opportunity to vest a government agency with oversight of Act 39? 
require full disclosure of the experimental nature and potential side effects of the lethal drugs being prescribed. Take action to make sure mental health conditions do not become the basis for assisted suicide in Vermont. And ensure that physicians involved have a bona fide relationship with the patient. More protections are needed, not fewer. And I urge you to vote no on S74. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking um, for questions, um, comments. Formulating a question. Please. Okay. Uh, but go ahead. I'm, I'm still thinking. Oh, you're still thinking. Okay. <laughs> Is she going to stay with us? Um, um, uh, Sharon, um, we, we do have a question from um, Representative McFawn, and um, I'm wondering, are you going to be able to stay with us this morning? Uh, yes, I can. Get... No, okay. I can stay with because you. We... Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn. Um, Madam Chair, uh, thank you. I, I, I want you to make a decision uh, about this question. Um, I, I'm, ref I'm, I'm going to bring people to page two, uh, small five. And it says, uh, the physician determined that the patient, that's the heading. And the underlined uh, section under A says a physician's physical examination of the patient. And then down lower, it talks about the physician informed the patient in person or by telemedicine. Is that a question for the uh, Legislative Council? Um, I'm trying to... I believe, Tapper, uh, um, uh, I, I believe it is, although I'm not okay. quite sure what your question is. Well, the question, my question is, uh, is there a need uh, for a in-person uh, physician's physical examination? The testimony, um, uh, the testimony here is there isn't, and I'm looking at these two sections. One says um, a and a physician's physical examination. You can't do a physical examination uh, over, um, you know, telemedicine. So I, I, I want to make sure that the I want to get that clarified. Okay, um, um, and um, I think I'm going to ask Legislative Council um, to clarify what the um, what is in statute. Um, so please, so you want me up there? Just I get. Um, um, yes, we, uh, yes, we do want you there okay. because then we can hear you. <laughs> Good morning, Jennifer Carby from the Office of Legislative Council. Uh, so looking at subdivision five there on page two. This is the requirement that the physician determined that the patient in, in subdivision A was suffering a terminal condition. And that is based on the physician's, and under the language in the bill, review of the patient's medical records and a physician physical examination of the patient. So a physician, whether it's this physician or another physician, must have done a physical examination of the patient. And that physical examination, I agree, a physical examination would need to be done in person, that's the physical aspect of it. Um, but that is uh, that is adding to or leading to that determination that the patient was suffering a terminal condition. So not only what was in their medical records, but that must include a physician's physical examination of the patient. Am I answering your question? Yes, and that physical examination uh, is that they were capable was making an informed decision, had made a voluntary request, et cetera. All of that stuff is done so in person. That physical examination is just modifying that determination that the patient was suffering a terminal condition. So the physician has to determine that the patient was suffering a terminal condition, was capable, was making an informed decision, that whole list. But the determination that the patient was suffering a terminal condition 
is based on the physician's review of the relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination of the patient. So that has, so, so my, the answer to my question is, a physician has to do a physical examination is of this person. Yeah. Is that correct? To ensure that- That is correct. Okay, that's the main thing I wanted. Thank you, Trevor. Um, Just on that same point, but it doesn't have to be the referring physician, as far as I understand it. It could be another physician did the physical examination. And that's a concern to me, okay. Thank you. That's it. Um, Chapter, uh, um, do you have another question right now? I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I have to get my hand down. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, Sharon, if you can stay, because there may be some more. Um, questions and uh, now we have um, David Englander. Thank you, John. Good morning, members of the committee. I am delighted to be before you today. I see you taking away my pillow and snacks that you sit by the table. <laughs> Uh, so good morning. My name is David Englander. I'm the senior policy and legal advisor to the Commissioner of Health. Um, the chair's indulgence, the committee's indulgence. I want. I don't know how much how much meant to retain. There's a lot of information. Would it be okay if I did sort of a brief history to locate the bill in time? Certainly, that would be. Okay. I think that would be helpful. That, that was confusing. You said certainly. <laughs> certainly. certainly. <laughs> um, but I'm going to have to ask you to. Um, speak up. Okay. Project. Please. I will try to project. Um, so in, in 2013, so just I'll, I'll kind of do this briefly. You can just keep me under the table. I'm going too slowly. Get your notes. <laughs> in 2013, when the, when the legislature took this the, this this matter up, was at that point was being called um, death of dignity. The legislature for many weeks, in fact, months, I believe, considered a, a Washington style bill where there was a where there was a stepwise process for physicians and patients, but there was also comprehensive reporting for, that, that is currently required by the by the Washington equivalent of the Department of Health. Um, as, as things sort of took a turn, as things went to the, the Senate uh, at, at the in the final hours before the vote, that bill was was changed radically. It removed the reporting requirements. It also had some imperfections that we that we're currently living with, and I think it, to some extent this this bill addresses. I, I think that so the Department of Health testified on this bill. We were supported by the Shell administration. The, uh, the the chair and, and other committee committee members may remember that actually Steve Shapiro, who at that time was the chief medical examiner, came and testified. Um, his support of the bill and the importance of having the underlying cause on death certificates and have it not have the death certificates not reflect this. And, and what he said was, was, I think, was particularly striking, which is this is extraordinary but not exceptional to the extent that this is the last decision made between the patient and the doctor in a lifetime of decisions. So following the passage of, of, of Act 39, the Department of Health, um, as, as is on our, our website, it, it said, it, um, the, the member read it, uh, it said, best would probably mean I wrote that paragraph. Um, there, is no, there is no overseeing entity, but the Department of Health, to the extent that anything is administered, the Department of Health administers the, um, uh, we, we administer the act to the extent that we collect all the information from patients and doctors. Um, but what we want to do, what the Department of Health wanted to do was, was to um, ease access to the, to, to the act. So we convened a large stakeholder group, which included nurses and Vermont Ethics Network and UVM Medical Center. And we created a whole series of FAQs for doctors, for patients, and the general public. And that's, you don't have an iPad anymore. So, so I, I made those available. So the FAQs were produced uh, and, and, and published on all of our websites. So that's available. 
uh, the department's health website. Um, there are also all of the um, all of the requirements of the act were just turned into a form so that so that doctors and patients didn't have to create word documents to ensure that all pieces of the act had been followed. So now it's just a series of it's a series of check boxes and signature blocks. We did not add or subtract the department of health didn't add or subtract anything. It simply it simply follows the tenets of the act. As we sat down, the stakeholder group sat down to discuss this, we noticed rather quickly that there were not liability protections for all healthcare providers. So and there was a concern particularly among pharmacists that they were going to be held liable for, uh, for, for providing a, a lethal dose. We reached out to the office of the attorney general who provided us an opinion saying that if our pharmacists were working within the app, within the scope of their license and were participating um, you know, under the act that they would not be held liable. So that is actually in our, that's in the FAQs. Um, and it actually, that was, that, that, that we got permission from the attorney general to actually publish it under their, under their name. Um, two years, so, oh, I'm sorry. A critical piece of Act 39 for passage was that the, the vast majority of the bill would sunset three years later. The idea was that the stepwise process laid out in the act would simply become a part of the standard of care, and that there was no longer there would no longer be need for a legislative imposition of requirements. But two years later, in 2015, it, it was general consensus among the Department of Health and stakeholders that the that the, that stepwise process was still very useful. Um, and uh, also that uh, there was an interest, there's a general interest that had a little bit more information about what was happening with the act. Policymakers on all sides of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the spectrum, as well as the General Assembly, the administration didn't really know what was going on because all information is held confidentially. So Act 27 of 2015 did, did two principal things. It required the Department of Health to adopt rules that would have that would that would provide us the ability to collect information from providers. It also required that we establish a rule for the disposal of the dose that was prescribed if it was not used. Uh, so since 2015, the Department of Health um, has produced a report required by the Act. I'm sorry, it, it, it's produced every two years, but I believe I, I have, you all have that now. Um, the information, as you see, is is fairly it's fairly basic and a fairly high level. Um, we, we say, for instance, the number of persons uh, suffering from cancer, we just say what kind of cancer. And that's simply to protect people's identity. That if we have Washington style reporting here, we are talking about somebody's race and ethnicity, their age, specifically what they're going to be dying from. In Vermont, those people were going to be identifiable. If somebody is a, a certain age, let's say hypothetically 49, and they live in Huntington or they live in Victory, that that my information would be identifiable. So the General Assembly with the Department of certainly support um, created this report that that gives folks uh, folks gives the lawmakers and policy the, uh, and policymakers and the public a view into sort of what's happening broadly, but doesn't allow you actually to identify who is actually using the app, which is which is central. Um, I mean, it's it's embodied by the fact that all information is kept confidential and the fact that the underlying Disease is not reflected in the in the death certificate. I'm sorry, the underlying disease is reflected in the death certificate, not the the, the final intervention um, by the physician. Um, where where this bill to the department's position, where this bill fits in is it, it closes the liability gap that 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 we try to close with with working uh, with the office of the attorney general, but it makes it very clear in the law that there is liability protection for healthcare providers. So the, the policy question, I guess, the, to my mind, before before the General Assembly is is really fair, fairly narrow, and it, it is about the, the, the use of telemedicine, um, and that and and from the department's perspective, as we think we try to think both broadly and deeply about equity, the use of telemedicine has been invaluable you know, in the time of COVID. Um, there are in the case of Act 39, patient choice. There are a small number of providers across the state who who participate, and if you have persons who are, don't are not not located geographically close to a to a, a physician who will do this, the ability to use telemedicine 
lo lowers the, lowers the barrier uh, to, to access with somebody a little bit far away. Means they don't have to, you know, think that they don't have to um, expend the they and their family to spend the time resource in order to go and see a physician multiple times. We count on physicians in Vermont to do a whole host of things. And one of those things is constantly assess the patients and their treatment. And so to, to my mind, the manner in which a physician is assessing a patient under the act is not, is not so different from the way they, they make all kinds of assessments every day. Again, I would come back to that formulation of it is, it is extraordinary, but not, but not exceptional. So, with that, I'd be delighted to take your questions. Um, I'm, uh, thank you for um, being here this morning, Mr. Linder. I'm just um, looking at the report that was submitted this year um, to the legislature. And um, so noting that over the last two years, it looks like there had been um, 29 confirmed deaths, um, 17, of whom used the prescription. Yeah. Um, however, it notes that 21 had actually filled the prescription. So presumably four people either died from the underlying disease, chose not to use the prescription. Um, and one of the things that I, I note in this, you also have sort of cumulative statistics from enactment. Do you, what, I, what I don't see in that, that's sort of the general, gives you the general of, um, 116. Um, and since you have the information about confirmed deaths and whether they use the prescription, why is it that you don't include that in the cumulative information? I'm sorry, it, what, what the, 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 number, the total number of prescriptions not used? Um, in, the, in, the, in the biennial information, yes. you um, you give the total number of confirmed deaths, the total number who used their prescription, uh, people who died from the underlying disease, that, that sort of like breakout there. I see. But for the cumulative information, you know, since the enactment, we only get the, the first level. I see, uh, because we only started collecting this information relatively recently. Oh, okay. Well, that answers that question. Yes, I apologize. All right, thank you. So I should have said that the, um, that, uh, all all physicians are required to fill out a form when they when they engage un, under our rulemaking. Um, they are not required to necessarily to determine the, the cause of death because sometimes the attending physician is in the presence of the patient at the time of death, and sometimes they aren't. But the vast majority of, of physicians have in fact told us whether or not they were uh, the, the, the ultimate cause of death of, of the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative McFawn and then um, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Englander, I would like to bring your attention to one of the requirements that a person has to be a Vermont resident. Um, my understanding is the act does not specify uh, or does not give a de definition of a Vermont resident or who qualifies as a resident. Is that true? That is true. And, and it's yeah. unusual that that the determination of residency is actually is actually made by the by the physicians themselves um, in the in the reporting forms the Department of Health provides just to be helpful, the kinds of things a physician might look at, um, whether it be a driver's license or, or a lease or, or a heating bill, but the, but the ultimate determination of residency is determined by the, by the physician. By the, by the doctor, which one? The, the first doctor that did the physical examination or yes. the doctor that might be doing it by telemedicine or is it either one? It, it, it is by the it, it is by the original physician who makes the determination who starts the process with the patient. Okay, so is it a could this happen? Um, I own a, a summer home in Vermont, or I lease a summer home in Vermont, 
um, could I leave Massachusetts and come up to Vermont and um, have this procedure done here in Vermont? Would that, uh, would that qualify me as a Vermont resident? That that would really that decision would be made by the physician whether whether they considered they considered you a resident. Um, oh, I so can basically. Have, uh, so basically, if any physician that uh, is dealing with that individual, if they decide uh, based on uh, certain things like uh, if if I rent a, a property, uh, is there any time limit? on how long uh, I have to be uh, renting that property. Could I come up from Massachusetts and uh, the next week start the process for physician assisted? Because there is no time limit and because there are different kinds of residency requirements in Vermont law, it's not consistent. Like it doesn't say six months, make somebody a resident. It would be up to the, it would be up to the physician. I would say that having spoken with many of the providers who engage in this law, they take it with an extraordinary amount of, of gravity. And it's not something that anybody does lightly. So I think if somebody had a summer home, it, it's hard to imagine. It's not that it's impossible because it would be allowed under the law, but it'd be difficult to imagine a physician taking somebody who, who is here seasonally as, as a resident. So I'll just, that's just an opinion. As well as everything else, it's just a pure fact. Yeah, and, and I would I would think that uh, I, I mean I don't know I, I'm 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 surprised uh, or I'm I'm concerned that a physician makes the decision whether or not a person is a resident of Vermont. One of those physicians, the, the physician that may be doing it by telemedicine, may not even know that person or anything about them. So I could come in from Massachusetts uh, two weeks ago and my family is here. So I came here and okay. That answers my question, thank you. But it, but it is on the physicians, we rely on the physicians ethos, their morals, their ethics, the law and the fact that their license is always on the line. So this is, these are never decisions that are made like I, also know I understand that, uh, but um, a person coming up um, to Vermont to have this procedure done because they they rented uh, an apartment, or maybe they came to stay with their family. Um, I see all kinds of ways that it wouldn't affect a, a physician's license um, because they're following what it says, all you have to do is rent the place, uh, own property, you don't even have to live here. If you, all you have to do is own property. And you, 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 that could allow you to be considered a resident of Vermont. I, I just think it's pretty I, loose. So. I, I, I guess I would say as a, as a lawyer, renting doesn't make you a resident. By, by mere fact of renting doesn't make you a resident. You do have to, you do have to live here. Uh, I mean, that, that is what, that is what residency means. Well, it says you can lease property. But if, but Vermont has to be your home. Okay, I, um, I have my answer, thank you. Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Englander. I know you gave us a little history lesson on this. So going back in history, could you fill in a little bit of why? I mean, to me, I would have thought certain communities in Vermont would have been concerned about this law because it, it's not equitable to all people suffering from terminal dis diseases and, and discriminatory in that way that certain people like ALS, I'll use as an example, would not be able to avail themselves of this procedure. And I was just curious why there wasn't more focus on that and uh, to come up with maybe a method, not to say I agree with this, this thing anyway on other grounds, but I was just surprised that it was such a discriminatory and 
not equitable law to begin with for people having end of life issues. So maybe you could give us a little background on that. And, and you're referring to the fact that a person must, a patient must self-administer the dose. Correct. They need the physical capability to, to, to pick up, to pick up the glass, to be able to, to be able to ingest, to be able to swallow. Uh, it, that's a, it was a policy decision made on the part of the General Assembly that, that physical, that, that they we used a Vermont, you, uh, that a word that is used uniquely in Vermont law, which is we say somebody is capable. That's not that's not used elsewhere. And so, uh, so my observation is that the General Assembly felt that capability fold into that was both a mental and a physical capacity. It is indicia of intent. But you're certainly right that there's a point at which patients are going to be physically incapable and they and they, they don't have access to Yeah, I mean, to me, it's these people, uh, it would seem with uh, a lot of people think they have more of a reason to do it than people with other types of terminal diseases, it would seem like. Anyway, I, I, uh, it would seem, well, I guess a follow-up would be, do other states allow people they can't self-administer to, to uh, do this, I mean, to uh, avail themselves of this. At, at, the, at the time, there wasn't. I don't know. There may, be, there may be folks in the room who know whether other states allow. I would say this, that if you allow another person to administer, there is a, there's a greater chance of some, of, of, we, when somebody self-administers, we know that they're, 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 they're making yeah. an active choice. No, I it certainly is, yeah. right, okay. you, you, you balance that. Again, the perfect way to do that is the legislature. You balance whether yeah. you think that that, that is going to create a problem for people who are mm -hmm. who aren't capable. Right. And there was there. I mean, there was, and stakeholders did express, as it was expressed today, express the concern about coercion. I, I do want to note, if I may, that there are there are there there have not been any instances I'm aware of in Vermont where coercion has been. Um, brought up as an issue. Um, in 2015, I'm sure the chair will remember, there was a floor amendment on, on the act that would have had the Department of Health report, done to do an annual report saying how many times persons who are not supposed, who are not authorized to sign, sign. And what I said, I think sitting right there, is there's no, there was a chair there, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, is that th there didn't need to be a report because if that happened, we would immediately contact law enforcement because someone was in danger. Mm -hmm. um, just so you know, there, ha there have not been instances of that. I'm sorry. There. there have not been any instances of that in Vermont. Okay. I know that wasn't part of your question. I'm just. Okay. All right. I, say, I just think it's strange that they wouldn't have tried to come up with some method that somebody could self administer or. Uh, anyway, I'm just surprised. Okay, all right. Um, Dane, and then Topper, I see your hand up, so you you will be after Dane. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Englander, for being here. Um, this is a question I've raised a few times, and my understanding is you might be the person to provide some context. Uh, the rulemaking regarding disposal, yeah. if somebody uh, does not administer the medication. Could you just describe a little bit about the process? Sure. It, I mean, to be honest, the, the the rule is as broad as DEA regulations allow. So essentially you have to destroy the medication so it can't be it, it, it can't be used. So a, co a common method. So there's two things. We want to destroy it. We also don't want it in the environment. So typically that means something like being mixed with coffee grounds or kitty litter, the two most frequently mentioned and we all have them in abundance, apparently. Um, and then putting those things in a, in a, in a, in an air, in a, in a liquid tight bag, there must be an easier way to say that. Um, and, th and then disposing it in the, in the trash or, or can be brought to, a, you know, a disposal site. I, I think the idea was that um, we wanted patients and physicians to know that, that there was an expectation that that would be, that that would be disposed of. So it's not, it's not more restrictive or more detailed than, than DA regulations. It's simply a clear notice to the participants. Carl. Yeah, just uh, if I could follow up to something that uh, Ms. Tubor brought up was the fact that the uh, 
I guess the most common drugs are not readily available anymore, and I'm trying to come up with some other uh, concoction. Uh, and so, what sort of level of testing would have to be done before those that new concoction would be dist uh, distributed or used? I, I recall several years ago there was lots of discussion on end of life things at correctional facilities that they went through a whole ream of different chemicals and almost everybody, almost all of them got voted down or were, were not allowed. And I don't even know what they use these days, but it was a big process. And I was wondering what sort of, uh, referring back to her issue there, that some people may die more slowly than they really like to because they're using some cocktail that uh, isn't, uh, isn't as quick as people would like it to be. So what sort of protections do we have on that from a phar pharmaceutical standpoint, I guess? Sure. Um, and so, and just briefly, the history of that is that there was the most, the most common, um, the most common dose that was used in all, was also was made by a German manufacturer um, that was also used in, in death and in, in, in prisoners executions. And so the German company stopped exporting to the United States because of their moral opposition to the death penalty. So which is what spurred the need for decisions to explore other, gotcha. other options. And then to answer your question, the answer is, the, is that all drugs would require FDA approval. For, for that intended use, right? End what? of life, okay. In other words, the FDA would have to approve it for end of life or what? Well, that that's actually a, a good question. I think I I don't want to get over my skis. I don't think FDA approves approves drugs for for end of life because there is a prohibition on use of federal dollars concerning end of life. Mm -hmm. not, excuse me, a, a, a patient choice. Um, so I don't I don't know off the top of my head, and I want to guess, mm -hmm. but I can certainly get that for you. Yeah, I'm just being curious. I, I don't think that the FDA says this can be used for. Yeah. Because, I mean, usually when a manufacturer comes, they say what the intended use of the drug is, and FDA determines that it will do what they purport it to be. And that's one of the things we see on the package FDA approved to do what it says it's going to do. So, just a curious, curious issue. Um, I believe. If we go on our web page, there is something from the pharmacist that references this, and I'm not quick enough to find it right now. But I believe the answer of um, as much of an answer as we have um, is on. We got that testimony in um, both verbally and in writing, um, verbally from the From the, from the lawyer and uh, a letter from the, um, I believe, single pharmacist who is providing medication. And I believe that a hand is going <laughs> up by um, uh, Representative <laughs> Taylor Small. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did that quick research for you to Thank find you. it on our webpage. Um, and it would be under Jeff Hochberg, um, which you can either go to Friday, April 1st to find that or under the witness list. Um, are there other um, questions right now um, uh, for the health department in the um, David Englander, or um, do you have anything else you want to say? Um, I'll be here all day um, to, to answer the committee's questions. Thank you. So I appreciate that. All right. Thank you very much. We will go to Sarah Teachout. Good morning. Good morning. Um, nice to see everyone here. I'm Sarah Teachout and I represent Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, and I want to say thank you for considering this legislation. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont very much supports it. Um, in particular, this section that um, provides pharmacists 
some protections, some legal protections specifically. Um, our role, just to step back, is when one of our members requires these medications, we have to locate where the drug can be purchased. Um, and at present, there is only one pharmacy in the state of Vermont and one pharmacy in New Hampshire where we can procure these medications. So we believe um, that this may help make the medication a little bit more widely available um, and easier to get for the person who needs it. Um, I, I don't believe that this alone is the issue, um, but, but I think it will help. So that is the reason we are supporting the bill um, and we support all of our members' health care choices. So happy to answer questions. Certainly. Sure. Carl. You said there's a manufacturing site or a pharmacy that this is available at. Pharmacy. A pharmacy. Yep. In other words, it's not available in Vermont at all. You'd have to go to New Hampshire to get this. Is there's it? one pharmacy in the state of Vermont oh, that okay. will fill the prescription. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Are there other questions or is there anything else that you want to add? That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ellen, are you ready? Yeah. Um, if, yeah. Please go ahead. And um, Julie, could you let, um, I know it's a bit earlier than you, uh, as a but I thought if we have this and then we take a break, um, that that would be um, more appropriate. Um, uh, and Ellen, please, um, Sit, uh, sit down. This is Ellen Jewett McKay. And Ellen McKay Jewett. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, if you would wait 30 seconds, um, uh, a fellow committee chair would like to be up here. Okay. Um, Representative Brad would like to be up here. Right. Right. Oh, oh, so we could, yes, I'm sorry. Um, you know some of us, but you don't know um, all of us. Yeah. So let us introduce ourselves right. um, to you and Pew from South Burlington. Yes. Tapper, could you introduce yourself? I'm Tapper McFawn, and I represent Barrytown. And I'm Jessica Brunstead, and I represent Shelburne and St. George. <laughs> I'm Dan Noyes, represent Wolcott, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. I'm James Gregoire, I represent Fairfield, Fletcher, and Bakersfield. Carol Fanella, represent London, Barry, Weston, Stratton, and Dan Whitman. Dan Whitman, Carl Benington. Nice to meet you. Ray Narfano, represent the Carl Rosenquist, represent the town of Georgia and Franklin County. Good morning. Taylor Small, uh, representing Winooski and Burlington. Good morning, Ellen. Nice to meet you in person. Uh, Teresa Wood from Waterbury, and I also represent Bolton Fields Gore in Huntington. Great to meet you all. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thank you for being here. We have just um, texted Representative Grad, and perhaps we'll wait a minute, and um, if not, we will go forward. Um, so that you don't. Thank I'll you. I'll leave so the <laughs> Thank you very much. Safe. Thank you. Um, and for those of you on um, Topper and Sharon, um, just so you know, uh, Sarah Teachout just left, so that you know who is um, in the in the room. Uh, uh, Representative McFawn, you have your hand up. Yes, um, Madam Chair, just a question. We're waiting for Representative Grad. Is she, is she specifically interested in this witness's testimony? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I think um, without, uh, I believe that she would like to be here to hear it in person, um, but, um, just this if particular witness. Had, yes. Um, There's other testimony. Uh, has oh, already she, been given. Uh, this, uh, uh, um, she is interested in all of the testimony. Um, okay. Former well, representative. 
Former Representative Jewett was a um, longtime colleague and vice chair of uh, House Judiciary. And as such, um, she wanted to be in the room if possible when his wife testified. Right, okay. I'm sorry to. Thank you. Since we're waiting, may I ask Mr. Englander a question or, or one that he could possibly answer? Oh, absolutely. All right. I, I thank you for the reference that Taylor looked up for me uh, about the prescription. I've thought all along that it was an injection for whatever reason. I don't know why I thought that, but I'm just letting it be known that I, I didn't realize that it was a suspension and something would take my mouth. Mm -hmm. that, that even makes me question more my initial issue. But anyway, uh, just, just saying, maybe you could. So what, was there something that led me to believe it was an injection or not? I'm trying to think. People, I, I can't that. say what might or may or not be your mind. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But it is, it, is a, it, is, it is it is a it is a liquid. I think I made. I think I thought it is a liquid in a in a yeah. In a no, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So. So there's nothing. There's nothing in the law that set that says injection. That we the term is okay. an injection. Thank you. Um. As much as I would like to um, wait, um, I think that, that um, it's hard for everybody. Um, so please, uh, uh, Ellen, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm Ellen Blackmer, McKay Jewett, and um, I'm Willem's widow. Um, and I really appreciate you guys inviting me here today to talk about our family story. Many of and, you. And, um, could you speak up both for this end of the table yeah. and for the, thank you. Many of you knew my husband, worked with him here in the state house for many years, and you knew that he was a strong advocate for Act 39 when it passed in 2013. I'm sure he never thought back then that he'd need to use it himself, but his, um, very, his diagnosis of a very aggressive mucosal melanoma um, in December of 2020 and the failure of immunotherapy, chemotherapy, radiation to control it made medical aid in dying an option that gave him and us, his family, enormous peace of mind. We are extremely grateful that he had that option. You know that Willem was a fighter. He had more energy, determination, grit, and courage than anyone I've ever known. He wanted to live more than anything. We were making plans for adventures right up to the end. This was a man who was 100% committed to living. He loved his medical team at Dartmouth Hitchcock. His girls and I and countless friends supported him every step of the way through his sickness. He was all in with his treatment. But knowing that he had access to medical aid in dying gave him and me and his brother and his daughters great comfort during his last few months when it became clear that there would be no cure. Willem hated using words like battling and fighting when talking about his condition. To him, it was more of a project, a project that he tried very hard to control. Karen Olschlager, another Vermonter who benefited from Act 39, put it well when she described her long illness. There can be a lot of pressure in our society to keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting, especially as a young cancer patient. I think that's what folks don't always, I, I think what folks don't always realize is sometimes keep fighting is really just a lot of prolonged physical suffering that gets worse and worse. Pointless suffering at the end of a terrible illness serves absolutely no purpose. Act 39 gave Rome control over the last chapter of his life. He thought about it for months and very clearly knew this was the route he wanted to take. He gathered us together in June of last year and told us this would be his plan if treatment did not work. And we all supported his decision. He was a world-class athlete and he was good at listening to his body. It became very clear 
very quickly when his prognosis worsened. He knew when it was time. Willem got to the point where he could no longer get into the car and drive to Hanover for treatment. And for him, that was the signal that he'd reached the end of the road. At that point, he was very, very grateful to have the medical aid in dying prescription on hand. Five days before he died, he reached out to Patient Choices Vermont and offered to lend his voice and firsthand experience to their advocacy to revise some of the bill's original wording. Some of that language made it incredibly difficult for dying Vermonters to jump through all the hoops necessary. Telemedicine visits, for example, rather than in-person visits would make their last few weeks much easier. Doctors can decide, as they do with all other patient care, if telemedicine is appropriate in each case. As Willem said, let's not let the legislature get between patients and their doctors. Act 39 gave Willem a peaceful and dignified death. It allowed all of us to be there with him in his last moments. While he was still the person we all knew and loved, he did not have to endure an increasingly medicated, painful, and drawn out death. We are so very grateful for that gift. Dr. Diana Barnard and Stephanie Stoddard, our spectacular hospice nurse from Addison County Home Health and Hospice, were with us at home that day. While it was a blur of emotions for all of us, what I remember most is the courage and humor that Willem was still able to share with all of us and the gratitude we felt that he was still in control of the most important decision of his life. It was a calm and peaceful and strangely happy death. None of us were happy that he was dying. But all of us were happy that he was still calling the shots. I'd be happy to take any questions. I don't have any questions, but I, I would say thank you for sharing your stories. It's very, very powerful. It's poignant, and, and people need to understand that um, at the end of the day, it's your choice. Um, and it's not the beginning of life. It's not the, um, I think Switzerland has a, a lot that's very, we'll say liberal, where you can just choose one day not to be there. Um, this is dealing with absolute pain. Uh, and the people, nobody deserves to go through. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate this. Helen, thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you for sharing a very personal story for the courage that you have in terms of sharing it. Um, like several of us in this building, we we knew well. And we knew how much he loved life. I couldn't keep up with him walking up the stairs. <laughs> um, and uh, he was feisty. Uh, and um, his courage and, and the support of you and his family um, in his decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you. Thank you for. Um, for sharing this. Does any, uh, I don't know whether there's a place for questions or further comments to you, or if there's anything else you would like to, to say. Well, I just, you know, I mean, it was such a short time before he died that he reached out and started, um, you know, that final push to help these changes go through. He believed in it, um, you know, 100%, not only from a, you know, ethical and legislative point of view, but from a personal point of view. He, had, he was in it, he was in it. 
and he wanted to make sure that other people had a slight had had slightly fewer barriers to get through when it came to them. And you know, I'm just really happy that I can lend my voice to help that stuff go forward because it's what he would have wanted. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just I'm sorry. I'm not very loud with my mask on, but thank you. I would just share that um, two years ago, my mom died at home. Without an estate where we did not offer this. And it was horrible. It is a gift. It is a gift that Vermonters have this option. So they don't have to go through that awful. And for the families, for those of us who are left, it, I think, I, I absolutely believe that it has enabled us to heal more thoroughly. You don't have to go through that awful period of helplessness and fear and you know, horror. And for the survivors, that makes a huge difference. That makes a huge difference. Sorry, Bashi. Thank you. It was, it's just, it brings it back. Yes. I am. Um, I'm so glad that I have an opportunity. The even the help. So thank you, thank you for being here um, and uh, committee. What I would say is this is a good time for us to take a break, um, and that why don't we come back at quarter of eleven? And um, when we come back at quarter of eleven, let's talk about what we have heard. If we have um, remaining questions for legislative council in terms of what the words mean, and let's just talk um, amongst our state, have a committee discussion about um, how we're moving forward. So thank you very much. And um, we're going to take a pause.